I'm a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Wednesday the 17th of November and as you'll see it's a fairly grey day outside here in the north of England and I'm going to be giving evidence from a paper today and the authors of this paper are suggesting that to get the optimum amount of vitamin D in the blood, to get the best amount of vitamin D in the blood, at this time of year adults need to be taking four to 10,000 units of vitamin D extra per day. That's 100 to 250 micrograms extra vitamin D per day. And they're also suggesting that with this, we take 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 to make sure that the calcium that's released by the vitamin D goes into the bones and not into the tissues. So I'm going to do this video in two parts because it's quite involved. So I'm just going to give a short video now where we get the main points of this across if you've only got five or ten minutes. So uh, COVID-19 mortality risk correlates inversely with vitamin D3 status is what this paper is about. In other words, you're more likely to die if your vitamin D is low. And they're saying that death rate could theoretically be brought down to close to zero. Now, of course, they're not saying that death rate ever would be zero because there's always other factors involved. But this is a theoretical consideration, but it shows the power potentially the beneficial power of increasing our levels of vitamin D in the blood. And it's a systematic review and meta-analysis. Now, this is the paper here. And of course, I always put the links to it. Uh, Heidelberg and Tubingen in Germany. Um, it's a very impressive paper, actually. You can get the download the PDF. You can get the, I think this is the full text version I'm on here. So yeah, it's all there. And and th this paper actually is, is very, very well... Um, written it's properly translated and it's quite intelligible if you read this you will you will understand it it's not it's not in scientific gobbledygook at all let's get straight down to it uh, blood uh, calcifidiol that's the active form of vitamin d in the blood correlates strongly with the sars coronavirus 2 infection severity and in death so no one really disagrees with this the question is that some people are saying well it's actually the fact that you get sick that lowers your vitamin D levels. Well, I think it's people with low vitamin D levels that are likely to get sick in the first place. And that's what this paper is about. And that's what this paper argues for strongly and, in my view, convincingly. And the fact that authorities haven't taken this on by now really is, well, it's it's just inexplicable why they haven't taken it on by, by now. This really needs to get its way into public health government ordained advice and it's simply not getting there so is it cause or effect so we believe it's cause and that's what this paper is arguing for now the strength of our immune system more or less neglected by the responsible authorities and i think you have to say this is right you know the authorities are focused on social restrictions um, lockdown measures vaccination measures some might say expensive pharmaceuticals Whereas we're not saying that those things are wrong, but we're saying we need to get the immune system optimised first. And it just doesn't seem to have been addressed very much, which is a bit surprising. So nutrition, physical fitness, recreation, sleep, all of these things, very important. Vitamin D deficiency is widespread in Europe and the United States, Canada. We, we know that. And the interesting thing, the data for this study was collected in March 2021. And it was collected on people that were unvaccinated. So this is not data which has been uh, affected by uh, vaccination. It is showing an independent uh, beneficial effect from optimising vitamin D levels in the blood. So it's a systematic literature review, retrospective cohort study. There was one good European wide study on that. So there was one of those. And there were seven clinical studies and they came to pretty well the same conclusion. Now, this is good because... One is a population study on basically healthy people who became ill. And the, the other the other is clinical studies on people who were ill. So two different ways of collecting data, but came to essentially the same conclusions. And we'll see that they are very, very closely related. Another reason I think these results are correct. Reported vitamin D levels pre-infection or on the day of hospital admission. So the big thing about this was they knew they took people into the study who they knew what the vitamin D levels were before or they took it on the first day of hospitalisation. And the key thing here is this is before the illness would have had chance to lower their vitamin D levels. 
So it's not after the illness has lowered their vitamin D levels, it's what their vitamin D levels were to begin with. And of course, people with lower vitamin D levels did worse. People with higher vitamin D levels did better. Of course, they corrected the results for mortality rates for, um, for age, sex, um, diabetes, all the things you would expect. It was well as a well-controlled study. Now, the results, they, they, what they found was that a negative Pearson correlation uh, between uh, D, D, D3 levels and mortality risk. Now, this Pearson correlation is just um, a statistical tool. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative correlation. In other words, as vitamin D levels go up, illness goes down. Or as vitamin D levels go down, illness goes up. So just, just to just clarify that, because I know that can be a bit confusing. So if we look at smoking and uh, lung cancer, we could look at towns or countries where, where, where there's so p people that smoke more get more lung cancer so we kind of get an upward trend like that that would be a positive correlation like that more smoking uh, causes more lung cancer well there's correlation that, that's how the cause of lung cancer was first identified but you can, we can also have negative correlations as well so a negative correlation like if you look at the amount of exercise and the amount of obesity that will go the other way around it would be the line would be in in that direction it would be the opposite effect. So um, whereas that one's a positive effect, this one will be an inverse or, or a negative uh, a negative effect between exercise and, and obesity, for example. So, so that's what these things are. That they are these, these uh, correlations. And uh, these two, two, two different ways of collecting the data, as we said, what, one was negative 0 0.4 and one, one was negative 0 0.4 and a bit. So um, both negative. Now, if, if the correlation is a negative one, uh, that's a perfect negative correlation. If it's zero, there's no correlation at all. And if it's plus one, that's a perfect positive correlation. So we can see it's quite a convincing correlation. here, And I'm going to show you the lines in a minute. Now, the combined data set, uh, they found that the, uh, the median levels of vitamin D were 23.2 nanograms per mil. But as we'll look at, they want it to be higher than that. So anyway, when they looked at the combined data, now the more astute of you will have realised that the studies on their own, that p-value there is not actually significant. And that p-value is not actually significant. We need 0 0.05 or less. So really that's non-significant data. But when they combined the data sets, they did get very significant data, which is good. So here we have that here. Um, the overall negative correlation was 3.9, and, and that does give a very, uh, very uh, significant result. And uh, the regression suggested a theoretical point of zero mortality at 50 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. Now, they're not saying this would happen, of course not, they're not stupid, uh, but it's a theoretical pointer. And here are the negative correlations here. So they are pretty, uh, pretty convincing. Now, the green one is the combined data, the red one is the population study, and the black one is the hospital data. But we can see for this, this uh, way of measuring death here, so that's increasing deaths up there. So as the vitamin D levels increased to increasing levels, 10, 20, 30, so that's increasing vitamin D levels up there, we see that the death rate went down. And the green line we said there is the combined data. And the green line crosses the bottom line there at zero deaths at about just over 50, as we've said. So it's a theoretical consideration, but that's that, that would be 50 nanograms per mil of vitamin D. But th there's very, very clear trends there that the, uh, the higher the levels of vitamin D, the lower the levels of death. It's very, very clear from that. Higher levels of vitamin D, lower levels of death. And we believe that, as we've said, we believe that this is not an effect. We believe it's a cause because the vitamin D levels were known before the people were ill. So it's pretty convincing. Now, a lot more scientific data on the second video, but let's just give some brief conclusions now from this. Uh, the authors say, direct quote, the data set provides strong evidence that low D3 is a predictor rather than just a side effect of a severe infection. Despite ongoing vaccinations, we recommend raising serum 25 vitamin D levels to above 50 nanograms per mil. So that is what they recommend. And to do that, 
they have found that to do that consistently, you need these kind of levels. Um, 4,000 to 10,000 international units of vitamin D uh, per day. That's 100 micrograms to 250 micrograms per day for adults when the weather's cold like this as, as in overcast. And they also recommend, as we'll see later, taking 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 with it. The fact that governments are not acting on this now, that there's so much evidence, and I'll be giving stacks of evidence in the next video, it really is, it's, it's hard to understand why governments are not taking action on this now. So keep that short and sweet at the moment, and we'll look at more data in the next video. Thanks for watching this short one.